Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are here for our very next episode of the Direct Selling Executives Forum uh, video podcast and our Women in Leadership series. Uh, today, I couldn't be more excited uh, to have Cheryl with us here today. I'll read her intro in a moment, and Gail will moderate our conversation, as always. Um, and for those of you that are new uh, to the DSEF, um, definitely join the LinkedIn group. The conversation is more active on LinkedIn than Facebook. We know it's about 400 of you um, participating in these panels and, and sharing your thoughts and questions. Um, if you haven't yet joined the, the LinkedIn group, it's an invite-only community that's free for direct selling executives. Just get an invite from, from one of your peers and come check out the group. Uh, today, we have a treat uh, to share with you. We're when we started talking about the topic of digital transformation, I said, mm, we should invite Cheryl Forbes. And and before we uh, jump into that, you know, Cheryl led digital transformation, um, huge efforts of a mammoth proportions in Cabby's transformation, in Norwex's transformation, now is uh, putting together and leading the teams for big changes over at Neolife. And when when we look at just all the different opportunities today in technology in direct selling, this is just going to be a really good discussion. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Cheryl. Pumped to have you here. Yeah, thanks awesome. for inviting me. So let me read Cheryl's bio for those of you that haven't met Cheryl before, and then we'll pass it off to Gail, our moderator. Cheryl is an IT executive. She drives strategic execution to realize organizational vision and goals through technology, accomplishes this by leadership and direction needed to deliver the technology necessary to an organization to realize their goals and strategies. Oh, necessary. You know what that means when you read in a bio gang? He's going to tell you what you, you may not want to hear, but it's what you need to get it done. And that's what I love about Cheryl. All right. Her passion brings both people and technology together, removing barriers to assemble teams to deliver high quality digital experiences. There's so much more here, guys. Uh, Cheryl received her MBA from Wake Forest University and Prosky Change uh, and is Prosky Change Management Certified. She's authored a white paper, Change Management and How It Affects Project Outcomes, and has been guest speaker at various CIO forums where she presents on the topics of project milestones, retrospectives for large projects, and piloting through internal organizational barriers. Cheryl, we're super excited to have you here today. Thank you so much for being on. So, Gail, as we kick off the session from the panel, what are the first questions? Go ahead and, and serve it up. Let's see where we'll start today. First off, I'd like to welcome everybody to this episode, uh, today's DSDF episode. And in this rapidly evolving landscape where technology plays a crucial role in shaping success, we'll explore with Cheryl how direct selling companies are leveraging digital tools and strategies to thrive in the modern marketplace. Our first question is, where do we start? What are the first steps that you'd invite a corporate team to take as they prepare to create a framework for their own digital transformation? Good question. Um, so the thing you wanna do right out of the gate is to get really, really clear on what it is you're trying to accomplish, but not only what you wanna do, but why you wanna do it. It's mm. really important to not only know what you're doing, but why. And, and then in conjunction with that, you also want to really talk through where are you trying to land in the future? What are the outcomes you are trying to realize and get really, really specific about those outcomes? Because at the end of the day, when a company starts to do a digital transformation, they're going to involve a whole bunch of people internally and rightfully so. And those people sit in different chairs and they look through different lenses. And so they're all going to come at it from a different perspective. And so because of that, if you have not only what you want to do, but why you want to do it and what you expect to realize as a result at the end of all of this, only then when you have all these people putting their opinions and their ideas on the table, it, it's really easy to sift through what's a priority, what's not a priority, and what's important, but maybe not right now. And so you want to parking lot those items for two reasons. One, they're good ideas and you want to make sure you don't lose them. But second, it also is a way to make sure that everybody's being heard. And if you want to keep want to keep people engaged in something like a digital transformation, it's super important to make sure that um, those people feel heard and everybody gets a voice in 
in the effort as a whole. Um, the other thing, and the last thing that I'll say is that sometimes in direct selling, um, there can be emotion that gets <laughs> infused, <laughs> gets infused yeah. into some of these discussions. And so um, uh, it's when you have some clarity at the onset, it, it makes it easier just to navigate through some of those conversations. Oh man, so many gold nuggets here. I love this clear, you know, what we're doing, why we're doing it, clear outcomes, no, realizing people have their lenses, being heard. You know, you know what I love about that question that Gail had brought up from the forum. You know, when people ask for a framework, it, it's it's a tool. And and the why you just shared, you know, Simon Seneca's his world famous TED talk on start with why, you know, the golden circle that I'm sure we've all watched that are whether you're here is, you know, went viral years ago. And I, I share that with all my staff. Even when you know when people interview at our company, they watch Simon Seneca's TED talk. We we have them write a review about it. It's one of the steps we do. So we're big start with why fans over um over here in my world. And I, I love that you shared that because when you get into the what's many times in digital transformation, or you bring lots of great smart people together who have their own opinions about how things should be done and lots of emotion from passionate stakeholders. Um, why are we doing this? Is a wonderful question to measure. Should we do that right now or should we do that later? Because there will be a plethora of ideas and scope creep will happen in these transformations and it will expand, just like Cheryl said. And, and if you don't know the why, gang, you don't know when to say yes and when to say no. And so I love that you shared that, Cheryl. That's that's just huge. Yeah, and the thing is, is you know, you want to make sure that uh, you're steering the ship the right way. And if mm -hmm. you don't do those block and tackling pieces right at the beginning, you end up with like a ship without a rudder. And to your mm -hmm. point, when you're in the middle of the storm, you don't know which way to go, where it kind of grounds you and keeps you, it brings you back to, you know, a centered a nice grounded, grounded, centered spot where you can look at it clearly. So that's what I've done in the past anyway, and it seems to help. And well, sometimes I, you have to change it. What you think you, what you think is, is your why and your outcome at the beginning. And then when you get in the middle of it, sometimes it doesn't fit. And that's when you have to adjust and that's okay. That's not a bad thing. Um, it just brings more clarity to your solution. You know, one of the things we'd love to do on these podcasts is share book recommendations. If you, if you're wondering that same question of how do you, how do you figure out why, um, in it, if you haven't yet read Simon Sinek, start with why fantastic book, it gives you many examples of what's actually a why and what's not. Um, cause sometimes we fool ourselves as leaders. And so I would definitely recommend that to you. Um, there, there are some other, there's actually one other book recommendation for clear outcomes in big digital transformations as well. Um, just because if you want to hear what types of things can really squash you, um, reading The Phoenix Project is a fantastic uh, novel as well that I, I just think is uh, applicable to those of you that are checking out this podcast. If you're here on this one, you know, you're here for a reason. And, and those would be the two so far from what Cheryl's uh, sharing. All right. What do we have next in the list, Gail? All right. Uh, the next question is... What pitfalls have you seen over the last year that you've encouraged corporate teams to avoid? Yeah, another one. <laughs> Some of these questions are loaded questions. Digital transformations are big, they're hairy, they're messy, they're hard. And if they weren't all of those things, then everybody would do it. So a lot of people don't do it because of that. And when you're in the middle of a transformation, you really cannot have any sacred cows, cannot. And so at the onset, you wanna put an external resource who is highly seasoned, has really deep experience, one of those been there, done that, seen that kind of person, and put them in charge of the effort right at the beginning. There's always gonna be curveballs that get thrown your way and you need a leader that's gonna know how to handle and navigate that. This person also needs to be very collaborative and they need to be a hammer when you need a hammer. They need to be a, a trusted advisor of the CEO. And they also need to know how to create a really safe place for the team to be able to thrive. And so 
putting internal people in charge of something like this, I would advise against. There's just too many biases that come into play. And in order for a company to get the desired result, they're gonna put the time, the money, and the effort into doing something that's this hard. You really wanna make sure that everything's on the table and you have a really strong person on, on the front end driving the whole thing. And you know, the other thing too here is that digital transformations, the stakes are really high. This is a very, very visible piece of work that's visible to the field, it's visible to customers, it's visible to your board of directors, it's visible to everyone. It's you're just, it's out there. It's important to stack the deck in your favor at the beginning of all of this and putting that external person, you're gonna have to pay for it. These people are not cheap. If you're gonna invest in this kind of an effort, that's a place where you don't wanna be penny wise and pound foolish. Now, the other piece of this is that the CEO has to have a unified leadership team rallying around the whole effort. Too often you get a C-suite person mm -hmm. or a senior executive where they say they're on board, but mm, not really. We're gonna kind of wait and see how this thing plays itself out. And when you get in the middle of the tactical execution of some of the pieces of the transformation, that's where you get derailed and sometimes the well starts to get poisoned. So a highly engaged CEO or an executive sponsor is another critical, critical piece to making sure that you set yourself up for success. You know, there's a there's a picture, Cheryl, that I really like as you were sharing that I, I think is so good. When um, you talk about how critical this is for the business, how it touches all these other stakeholders, the picture I've shared is it's heart surgery. I always think this is good. It's always <laughs> good. This is heart surgery. And so would, would you pick your, your young internal project manager to take care of heart surgery for this organism that is your business. And, and you see, you, you think about it in your own life, like when you go in for a surgery in, on your body, you're not looking for the kid that just finished that special fellowship out of medical school. No, you're looking for the one that's like, yeah, I've done 34,000 of these in my life. And uh, right. I'm really good. At, I'm really good at these. Like I, I do like four of them a day and I, I'm really good. You know, like that, that surgeon, you know, when you, for any of the smaller products, I know heart surgeons don't do that many, but when you have regular other surgeries, there's, there's guys who have, yeah, I've done 4,400 of these already, you know, type stuff on their profile. And you sit there and say, wow, well, that, that person's good. And when it comes to digital transformation, there are uh, groups of people who have led seven figure digital transformations for organizations in the direct selling space. So not outside of this, but in the direct selling space. And it is key to have those folks on board because the people that are on your team right now are the ones that got you where you are. You got to remember that. Right. They're the that's ones that right. most of them are the ones that said, this is okay. We can do it. Okay. Yeah. It's not serving you. It's not serving you. So if you're the CEO and you're in that spot, it's, it's not only vendor partners, but it's it's many times a people person. Oh, we recommended Gino Wickman's book, um, Traction, on a previous podcast. In there, you talk about having implementers, people who come in and step in for a specific purpose. And it's a lot of what I heard as as Cheryl's talking, gang. And so just, just think about that as you're hearing. Yep. We're not going to put the minor league team on the major league field and expect to win the game, right? <laughs> you're not going to. You don't want the guy who's still getting into fellowship, doing your leading your heart surgery. That's not... Not what you're looking for. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Our next question is, if there was only one new initiative you thought every company should explore, what would it be? So Cheryl, I have to give you a caveat of who asked that. So the, there's always this executive who is in the forum who will say, we're loaded up on, you know, we're loaded up. We can't look at anything for 18 months in our organization. We're busy. Okay, fine. What if I could only do one thing? What could I do? You know, and that's that, that's the attitude and tone behind. Gail says it so nicely. That's that's the attitude and tone behind the submission of the uh, one thing question. So it seems to get submitted often in our world. So what would you say to someone who who throws it out there like that? Now now you know who you're talking yeah. to. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So here's here's what I would say to that. I would do a really honest, true, true assessment of how easy is it for people to spend money with your brand. Oh, that's because good. if it's hard, if I if it's hard, I'm out. I don't have nobody has time. Nobody has time, right? Yeah. Everybody's doing everything on their phone. 
on the couch in the yep. couch, waiting for the kids to be to soccer practice or whatever it is. And if you're trying to sell, and there's so much noise, right? All these commercials and there's brands and there's products and there's all these things coming at you from all these different platforms. And how do you sift through it all as a consumer? And how as a brand do you rise yourself to the top? Well, look, you may have a great product, but if it's really hard for me to find your product, to search for your product, it, to check out if it's 10 minutes later and I'm still clicking around trying to figure out how to do it, I'm out. I'm done. I can't. Yeah. I can't do it. I'm not an anomaly. I'm the norm. Oh. And people who are way younger than me are even more obnoxious about it. And yeah. so here it is. Is your brand really, truly assess it? Is it easy to do business with you? Is it easy to spend money with the brand? Is it easy to find the product? Is it easy to check out? Is it easy to enroll? If you're trying to attract new people to the, your business, is it easy to enroll or is it you know, wallpaper in the walls with? And I know this compliance and legal and I respect that and I appreciate it. And I know we have to have it and I get that, but there's a balance. <laughs> and and you know, signing up for subscriptions. If your brand has a subscription model, is it really easy for me to sign up? Is it easy for me to change it? Because at the end of the day, John Fleming said it right. We are in the ultimate big economy and consumers, distributors, whatever you call them, customers, they want it fast. They want it fresh, modern, easy, hassle-free. And brands that crack that nut, are the ones that are going to leave their competition in the rearview mirror. They're the ones that are going to keep the existing customers they have. And they're the ones who are going to get the new ones. That's the game. That's the game we're in right now. Yeah. And, and everything moves really fast in technology, creating that experience in a meaningful way for the brand is critical. Those are table stakes. Table stakes. For those of you that are listening, gang, whether you're on the YouTube or whether you're listening just on audio, this is a pause and take note moment of what Cheryl just said, because even big companies miss this. Um, I was in meetings in 2018 with the board of a very large wellness company. They were at about $950 million in revenue that year. They were trying to get to a billion and couldn't break a billion. And we're like, when are we going to make a billion? You know, they're doing this. And they said, you know, we're going to have Deloitte do a study on our enrollment. Guess how much time? the average enrollment was taking 40 minutes. Gang, 40 minutes. You, so you think of the friction. Now, this company happened to have lots of options on enrollment. When you have lots of options, I won't, I won't share who it was, but you know, when you have this flavor or this flavor of this flavor, or this flavor of this flavor for your pack, where it's not just strawberry or chocolate, it's strawberry chocolate or, or strawberry vegan or strawberry vegan sugar free. And you got to get to these options. What's happening is you're creating what we call phone call moments. And that's how you get to the 40 minutes. If, if you get to some of these processes are so bad, your customer literally can't decide and has to get on the phone with the friend that invited them to enroll to make sure they're making sure they make the right decision. And that's just ridiculous. Some of the highest performing uh, case studies we've got to look at to what Cheryl's saying have, have said, hey, on your enrollment form, just have them put in their credit card and pay your admin fee. Don't even let them buy a pack. There's three packs. Don't do it there. Enrollment form on the phone, just let them sign them up and enroll. And on the first screen in your virtual office or your back office, put the packs there after they're already enrolled and in the team tree. Because guess what? Then there was no phone call moment for them to join. Because the only option was name, email, pick a username, pay the admin fee, agree to the terms. If you're a pack people and that's who you are, the pack's on the inside right afterwards. And the numbers on that are ridiculous. To what Cheryl's saying, getting, that's the real stuff. If you can remove any of those, the friction causing phone call moments, gang, those are killing you. And so thank you, Cheryl. That's phenomenal. Yeah. The big thing is, you know, you're in these meetings, these in strategy meetings, and and everybody just keeps saying, well, we just need to make it simple. And, and I got to tell you, simple is hard. It is simple hard. is it's good really, US. really hard. Yeah. Remember the old Fitbit? And they got, they got bought. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm still a user. I, I compete with family on Fitbit. I love Fitbit. 
I'm a Fitbit guy. I, I do the yeah. same thing. Yeah. My friends give me challenges, and then I'm at the at the end of the weekend. I'm done with the challenge, and they hadn't started. And I'm like, hey, wait, what happened here? Yeah. <laughs> but my point family. is, yeah. I bit, I brought a Fitbit for a reason. That UI, when they first came out, that UI, it was clean. It was simple. Nobody needed to figure out how to use it. It was self-sustaining. You didn't need a user's manual. You turned it on and you just went. And yeah. that is not an easy thing to do. But what I'm talking about and making it easy to spend money with your brand, that's what you need to get to. And it's hard because it's hard, but it's also hard because whoever implemented what they have now you're kind of in a situation where you have to say, well, that baby's not really that good looking. <laughs> mm-hmm. Your baby's so, kind of ugly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's one of those moments. And so yeah. it's not disrespect or to, uh, you know, to um, to say that whoever was responsible for that didn't do a good job. They did a great job at the time with what, what it was they were trying to accomplish. But now that we're here in this new world, the stakes are higher and it needs to be easier and cleaner. So, yeah. Well, and, and you're going to you're going to get feedback from the field. OK, the field is going to know how they did it six years ago in a different company and knocked it out of the park. And if you only change it to be what we did six years ago, then we'll be able to really win. And you got to be careful with some of those voices, gang. It was a very different world six years ago when they knocked it out of the park. I've heard this twice this week, Cheryl, to your point. It's back to the pack thing, but of so-and-so leaders joining our company, and if we just add this pack, they'll all join us, and wow, it'll be so great, and they'll move these people. And I sit here and say, you're going to confuse the whole enrollment process for one leader's uh, whim. And that's why I really encourage you, if you can find ways to, you have to keep the whole thing simple, not overcomplicate the offer. If you have some special pack or offer from an acquisition or something else, do it on the inside of the virtual office. So once, once people have already made a decision to join you, you got in, not right up on the, on the front. So that's quality stuff. All right. Back to you, Gail. The next question talks about data. We're in a world that worships data. What key performance indicators have you found to be most important uh, when it comes to decision making? So data is king, no question. And every company should have KPIs for sure, you know, nice little barometer checks. But in today's day and age, things are moving so fast with technology. And by the time you look at a report, a static report, it's it's obsolete and it's not accurately depicting the situation that at hand and what the story is trying to tell. That it's already, it's in the past. Um, And I think data should be real time. I think it should be predictive. And it comes to people in the form of calls to action so that you can actually change outcomes at a fresh moment and not trying to change an outcome based on past data. So real time data can help executives make the right decisions um, or show them where to focus their time and energy so that we're not chasing yellow balloons and we're really focused on where that executive's time and energy needs to be focused on. And this can be applied across all functions, sales, marketing, finance, warehouse management, supply chain, on and on and on. All your different functional areas can get dashboards of real-time data that can really tell them right then and there the heartbeat of their function and where they need to make adjustments or where they need to do more of what they're already doing. A company's data is a tremendous asset if it's invested properly, if it's invested in properly, and it can take the company to two new levels, but you got to invest in the right way. And, you know, you can start small and do small incremental things. And then over time, build out your data warehouse and make it very robust. I think it's a walk before you run kind of effort. And I also think that it's sort of like tuning a radio. You keep knob turning on your dashboards with data that it's giving you until you get the right mix 
of what it, of what different functions need in order for them to be effective in using that data. And you know that just takes a little bit of time. But at the end of the day, I think companies who are using data to make data centric smart decisions and help to highlight when they need to pivot, when they need to stop and do something different, or that data can be used to evaluate and re or or shift a strategy. That's when companies get smart. And that, again, is another competitive advantage that they can have over their competition because all of a sudden now they're more nimble. They can pivot faster because they've got the information at their fingertips in order to be able to do that, as opposed to the company that's looking at static reports from last month, April, and now they're trying to figure out what to do in May. Exactly. There's a report we published in December through the DSEF, and it, it talks about that, that idea of why why are you still building your business looking in the rearview mirror, like you just said last month, Cheryl. And I think that the data conversation we're seeing from that report, we, we can put it in the show notes. Um, you know, for, let's, let's do that. For anyone who hasn't read the DSEF Viable Trends report, that's a great place to start with what Cheryl's saying, because because it's not just transactional data, like Cheryl's saying, gang, that I'm I'm seeing as well. And the report highlights some of this. You got to be thinking about your leading indicators, gang. You got to be thinking not just about sales, enrollment, subscriptions, and what was today versus last month and timing, but it's also what creates sales. Because there's some companies who, you know, enjoyed some viral growth during COVID and are now saying, why aren't we growing anymore? Like, what is it? And they they had a little fake bump there that they got and they, they want it back. But and some people are growing and some aren't. You know, it's a good report. It, un, it unpacks a framework that'll walk through just simple optimizations that can help you raise your revenue per active distributor number. And it a lot of it comes back to getting data earlier in the sales process. So instead of just looking at sales enrollments and subscriptions, and always make sure, just like Cheryl's saying, when you get to real time, well, what are you asking about real time? Well, what if it's the things that create sales? Okay, now we're talking. All right, and, and start identifying that and getting real about that. And you, you won't always be right to Cheryl's point right away. You won't know like exactly what creates sales. And a lot of people start with samples. Hand, if you're in a wellness company, samples handed out. Or if you're you know, in other companies, it's probably landing pages opted into or webinar pages attended, meetings hosted. These are some good leading indicators to be thinking about. And when you get really advanced, you start thinking about what creates those leading indicators mm. and how you can start tracking those pieces. It's good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. I mean, just, just imagine a day. Imagine mm-hmm. you have all of your field leaders every morning, they wake up to a dashboard or maybe once a week, they wake up to a dashboard. Let's just say every day. And that leader has a list of Here are all of your team members who are most likely to not hit their bonus. Here are all of your team members who are based on behavior patterns are most likely to not renew. Mm. So what if you started getting that kind of data? So now as a leader of my team, I know who I need to focus on. I need to to know who I need to bring along. And what if I know, oh, these five people here, they're automatically gonna get their bonus because they've already hit certain hurdles. So maybe now I can celebrate them early and encourage them to do even more as opposed to just sitting back and coasting through the rest of the month. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different ways to look at this. That's just one, that's just a little microcosm of of, of what can be done here with data. And it's so wonderful to hear how your whole world changes by just asking different questions, right? You know, Wayne Dwyer, Dyer said that for years. And you think about, you know, the way we look at the way we look at things and the things we look at change and, and how you ask questions, gang, is everything. So listen to how Cheryl asks those questions. You might be making some notes to ask some better questions. That's good stuff, guys. It's really good. Gail. Was it, was, is there one more? How many more we got time for here on the panel? I know we, we just ran yeah. to Cheryl's time. So we got time, you got time for one more, Cheryl? Can we hold you on? I know we're over time for you today. Do you have a one more minute yeah, for us? Yeah, sure. Okay, Sure, perfect. one more minute. Go, go for it, Gail. Our last question for today is, if you could go back 10 years, knowing mm. all that you know now, what would you tell yourself? <laughs> Run away. No. (laughs) (laughs) Um, 
<laughs> Take a breath, go slower, and let people catch up to you. So I have a little bit of a, I, it's a gift and a curse all at the same time. When I'm given something, I literally can see a path of exactly what needs to be done. And then I run like the wind to go make it all happen. Mm -hmm. But when I was younger, when I was younger, I would go run and do it. But then I'd be looking around going, wait, where is everybody? And I'd leave everybody in the dust and I wouldn't be bringing anybody along with me. So that, of course, was a hot mess. And so yeah. you know, now I see the value in going slow and I go slow to go fast. And if that's a strategy and bring everybody along before, you know, jumping into action mode. So in some, I guess I would have to say I've learned remarkable restraint at that and it pays off in the long mm. run. But th that is real duplication, though. I think when we all get to the end of our lives, you know, we're gonna we're gonna remember the people whose lives were changed because we were around, you know. And I think that's the people who are gonna remember us. And so, taking the time to bring others up is also the the right way to scale things. We see it all the time when executives don't take the time to duplicate, and then they have black holes all around their organization uh, that are just gaps. And you know, and that's that's a solid word, Cheryl. Thank you for sharing that today. That was that's really good. You know, it is such a treat to have you here today. I'm so grateful. Thank you for spending an extra five minutes with us going going over today, Gig. If if this is your uh, very first time uh, watching one of the sessions, and be sure to subscribe uh, where you're at. And Gail, go ahead and let's walk them through it. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, where else can they find today's podcast for those that are looking for more information? If you're listening to us on YouTube, we are also on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and we do live streams as well. We're live on Facebook and LinkedIn every Tuesdays and Thursdays. We have we launch two episodes a week. Um, That's fantastic. Stay tuned because we have a lot more coming. Yeah, this series already, as of filming today, this is number eight in our core series, and we have three more already in the calendar team. So, so far, it's been such a treat to have Cheryl and her peers uh, take the time to be a part of this series. I'm excited for each of you that have kind of shared questions and concerns and challenges of what's going on in your world, and that we get a chance to handle it together, people who are doing it today. Cheryl, thank you so much for being here today. It was an absolute treat. I hope you have an amazing day. We'll talk with you soon. Bye for now. Thank you.